Hello, 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 and welcome to our unorthodox, orthodox Easter spectacular. Um, we've got a great show lined up for you today. Um, Steve should be joining us in a little while. I put out a bowl for him sort of as our token Elijah for today. So when he arrives at our, our dinner, he will be here. Um, but uh, happy Easter, happy Passover, happy just, well, Good Friday, whether you have any religion whatsoever. But this is going to be a religious special. And what we're going to be talking about in, this is our number 22, is our 22nd, 23. I'm looking at Rebecca, who's behind there. Uh, Rebecca says this is our 23 webinar, 23rd webinar. And what we're going to be doing is doing something which is very dear to my heart, um, which we're going to talk about history, um, not the religious part. The religious part, you know, it's there too, okay? But it's really about history and what we can learn from history. And one of the things that we did very early on in our trainings was that we were working in the deep south of the United States. And one of the things that we realized very quickly in working with organizers or working in the deep south of the United States is that religion pervades every aspect of social life and political life, and in particular, Christianity. And that Christianity had really been hijacked by the right. Um, it was something that they owned. And one of the things we realized is that we needed to take some of that back. Um, that actually, if you look at most religions, regardless of what they are, they are more on our side than they are on our opponent's side. Most religions at their core have ideas of community and sisterhood and brotherhood and equality and egalitarianism and the idea of justice. Um, and that we allow that to get hijacked by the right when we can't actually speak in those terms. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a really sort of just brief overview, and I mean brief, of three of the Abrahamic religions. We're going to talk a little bit about Judaism, we're going to talk about Christianity, and we're going to talk about Islam through the lens of their prophets. Um, so without much further ado, thank you. There's our Passover Easter special. We missed the unorthodox Easter because um, we we're actually in Beirut. Um, and uh, But it is orthodox Easter, so we're at least on message for that. Um, but again, this is our unorthodox Orthodox Easter special. All right, so I think we need to begin by talking about Jesus. Now, when you say, I want to talk to you about Jesus, you know, the first thing people do is they look away, okay? They run to the other side of the street, okay? It's sort of like when you're on a sidewalk and someone comes up and says, hey, would you like to save the wolves or save whatever it is? The thing you want to do immediately is go, yes, I do, but no. Same thing happens, we're going to talk to you about Jesus, okay? But we're going to, you know, talk to you about a particular Jesus, okay? Not just Jesus qua Jesus, but a particular type of Jesus, okay? Um, and so which Jesus are we gonna talk to you about? Not this guy, okay? Um, and not that guy. What we're gonna talk about is this guy. So who is this guy? This is what forensic anthropologists think that Jesus probably looked like um, 2,000 years ago. And this was not the religious deified Jesus. This is not the Jesus which is resurrected and becomes the icon of the Christian church. This is a radical Jewish Mediterranean peasant who is waging war against religious authority and Roman colonial power 2,000 years ago. Um, and that's the Jesus we want to talk about which is Jesus of Nazareth, okay? And he's a revolutionary, and he's a pretty good revolutionary, judging by the spread of Christianity over the past 2,000 years. And why he was good is like Moses and like the prophet Muhammad, he understood the importance of sign, symbol, story, and spectacle. And he also very importantly understood that critique had to be matched by vision that it wasn't enough to just criticize the Roman Empire and the stagnant religious authorities. He also had to create this vision of another world in the future. All right, so we're gonna talk about two things with Jesus today. We usually, when we do this, you know, I just drone on endlessly. I should admit something, which is my dad is a minister and my grandfather's a minister. Um, and actually I go to church and I'll do a little segue here, okay? So I'm on my way to church the other day and we're late as usual and my son, uh, my younger son, you know, uh, is, is particularly dawdling. And so being sort of sarcastic, I say back to him, 
um, hey, hurry up or Jesus is going to be pissed. And without missing a beat, he turns around and says, who the fuck is Jesus? So anyway, I've got a little work to do with him about his religious education. Um, so anyway, I'm testing it out on you. Any case, Jesus did a lot of things. I mean, the guy walked on water. OK, and he turned, you know, a couple of fish and bread into mass amounts of food for poor people. But what I want to talk about today is three things in particular. One is because it's near to Passover um, and Easter happens during a Passover dinner. Um, what and who he invited to dinner, who he brought into table with him. Now, who you invited to dinner in biblical times was incredibly important because what it symbolized was those people who you thought were important, who that you could bring into your extended family. Ah, Elijah's here. There he is. Elijah just showed up. Okay. Uh, so, so Steve, I'm talking about Passover dinner. Okay. Okay. Um, and we brought you the bowl for Elijah. Oh, thanks. That's you. Okay. Um, Did you um, tell them that you go to church? I did. I you told didn't tell them that you read the Bible. Uh, I didn't tell them that, okay. but I think they're going to figure it out. All right. Uh, yeah. And and I also read the Quran too. So is everyone not creeped out though? Like it's only you that gets creeped out by this. It's I mean, not just me. No, it's only you. It's actually most people don't get creeped no. out by this. No, they're but, all. They all think. Is he trying to convert me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We did talk about the idea of that. That the, the conversion that we're doing is actually conversion it's a secular. Of, the secular conversion. Good, okay. Not right. not from a religious. Let's so no one's back. creeped out. If you're creeped out, write in the comments. Stop creeping me out. Right. I think I think it's your, it's your projection, Steve. Honestly. It is. It is, exactly. <laughs> it absolutely uh, is. So anyway, we're talking okay. about we're yeah, talking sorry. about Passover. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, who people who you invited to dinner in biblical times was really significant. Um, because that was the type of people you said are you should be in my community. This is okay? my crew. Exactly. It's my crew, basically. <laughs> and so who Jesus invited to dinner is really interesting because who he invited was women, verboten at that time. Children, verboten at that time. People that had physical ailments, lepers, totally verboten at the time. And tax collectors, Roman tax collectors. And sex workers. And sex workers, definitely. And his friends were sex workers. Probably yeah. his lover was a sex worker. Um, Wait, what? <laughs> we'll leave that out. We'll leave that out for a Part second. Part two. Part two, exactly. Um, and so what? You, why was Jesus inviting all these basically freaks, losers, and outcasts to dinner? Is because what he was trying to do is saying, in my world and in the world that I wanted to bring into being, these are the people that are important. That the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And he didn't do it just by preaching it. He did it through a performance. Yeah. Um, and so the takeaway there is something which you can... Um, I'm gesturing to Rebecca there, is about prefiguring the future, um, which is one of the things that we can do as activists is actually um, within our struggles, within our performances, within our protests, we can actually demonstrate, okay, the world that we want to bring into being, because often we demonstrate like, you know, how much we hate the cops. Is that really the world that we want to bring into being, right? Um, or do we want to create a performance which gives the message of the future we want to bring. So this is like a step beyond be the change. It's perform the change. Yeah. It's like, like live, visualize the change. Bring yeah. it into reality, live right. it, like bring the future to the present. Exactly. And so, you know, Jesus did this all the time um, during Passover, actually Palm Sunday. Um, oh, go back one. We're going to stay at the prefigure of the future for a second. <laughs> um, oh, should talk to you. Why are these people in Lego? I, um, I haven't talked about that, yeah. It's so people won't be creeped out. It's because people won't be creeped out. There's this guy, there's this minister in San Francisco who's created the entire Old Testament, New Testament, and Lego, and he gave us permission to do this. So yeah. Anyway, um, Jesus, uh, in entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, um, rides on a donkey, right? And here's ostensibly the Son of God riding in the back entrance to the Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, what biblical scholars have pointed out is... So that would be like going to the big, the Oscars in a Toyota Corolla through the back door. Exactly. Okay. And who's coming through the front door? Pontius Pilate and all of the Roman Empire. So give me a contemporary... So who's coming through the front door is like someone in a limo. 
Right. Like, uh, of course. And, and like, you know, it, with a beautiful gown. With a SWAT team. With a SWAT team. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> with a SWAT team. Exactly. <laughs> and so what Jesus is doing is he's like, he's basically saying, look, my republic is going to be a humble republic. We yeah. are going to ride on a lowly ass. I am the son of God who's just sitting on a donkey. And again, it was about showing, demonstrating his politics instead of just telling people about it. And he did this all the time. So one of my favorite parts of the Bible, and there's where I'll geek out on my Bible history, um, is, yeah, we can go to the next one, um, is where Jesus would sort of engage in word trickery with people. So there's this one moment when the Pharisees, who are the high priests at the time, come up to him and say, hey, Jesus, should we pay taxes to the Roman Empire? It's like a trick question. It's totally a trick question. There's a setup. It's a setup, right? <laughs> Either way he answers, he's going to fail. Like if he says, yes, we should pay taxes to the Romans, he's like, all, all credibility is a radical Jew, right? Right. But if he says no, he gets arrested. Because he's saying you should defy the empire. Exactly. So what does he do? I don't remember. Oh, come on, Steve. I don't read this stuff. Oh, you know, Steve's mom and dad, his dad was a former Franciscan monk, a Dominican monk, and his mom was a Dominican nun. Yeah. Farmer. Uh, farmer. Yeah. Farmer. Farmer. Okay. But still, still. Yeah. Still, you're letting him down. Okay. In any case, I'll tell you what So he is. says, wait, what's the question again? The question Let is, should we pay taxes to the Roman Oh, yeah, Empire? yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, I'm not going to answer your question. Exactly. I'm going to tell you that what's on that coin no you, you, you got to set up got to do the setup oh he's okay. he i says, don't know he says <laughs> take out a coin take okay. out a coin okay whose face is on that coin and it's a roman coin say, right it's caesar and he says give on to caesar what is caesar's and give on to god what is god's right boom yeah in, okay. your face. in your face. Okay, so what does that mean? Whatever that part, means. <laughs> part of the thing about Jesus, and we talk about this in the long version of this, is he always speaks in weird, like cryptic, you know, utterances He's and a metaphors poet. and stuff yeah. like that. And why he does that is because then we talk about it for generations, okay? But in this case, with the radical interpretation is he's basically saying, look, if we have a discussion about whether we pay taxes to the Romans or we don't pay taxes to the Romans, the Romans have won. They framed our discourse. I'm going to change the page. I'm going to shift the frame. And I'm going to talk about the world that we want to bring into being, which is the world of God's. And the takeaway here is, is that we can't get wrapped up in what our opponents are talking about. Or is, tweeting about. Or tweeting about. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to say, that's, we're against that, but this is what we're for. You got to shift the frame because that's where you have power. As long as you're talking about that's bad. Donald Trump did this today. Donald Trump did that today. We're still talking about Donald Trump. Yeah, you're fighting against this other building. Exactly. Which I'd say, you know, there's sometimes you got to fight against, but yeah. you definitely have to be building. You can't get caught up in what your opponent is doing. Exactly. All right. So, boom, it's Easter, right? What's Easter about, Steve? The resurrection. Well, okay. What is Good Friday about? The crucifixion. There you go. Why it's called Good Friday? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Never, ah. never, never quite sure about why it was called Good Friday. Yeah, In any case, bad Friday. So the bad luck Friday. Exactly. The crucifixion. Okay. So th this is one of the weirdest things about the Christian faith, right? Which is the Son of God allows Himself to be killed. Like, what is that about? He's supposed to be like the Son of God. You know, he can do anything he wants. He can walk on water. He can walk on water. He can turn loaves into fishes and... And water into wine. Yeah, and for the multitude. For the multitude. Why does he allow himself to be crucified, right? Like and he could have gotten out of it. If yeah, he exactly. To. So there's the orthodox, not orthodox Christian, but the orthodoxy of Christianity, which is about he died for our sins, never figured out what that's about, okay? I don't think he died for our sins. Here's my interpretation okay. of it, which is in the Gospels, Right leading up to this, everybody's following him. They're saying, Jesus, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And it's really interesting. In the Gospels, he's like, tells his disciples, you deal with them. I'm going to the mountain. Okay? Yeah. And he tells people at all times when he's doing these miracles, don't tell anybody I did this. Right? That he actually is very, very ambivalent about the fact that he's leading a movement. And so no. here's my theory. Okay. 
This is your theory. No, I mean it's 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 a it's the radical theory, but I'm gonna okay. explain it, okay? Because right. right. yeah. I don't want to put it on the center because it might lead to our excommunication. Okay. Okay. So just you, just just me. On this I think case. I'm already out. I think <laughs> there's documents about me. <laughs> okay. Um, my theory is uh, that Judas was not a betrayer, but his best friend. Um, co-conspirator co-conspirator and that jesus um essentially allowed himself to be killed and maybe he's he like let's him set it up let's set this yeah exactly and he did need that to get out of it if it as long as i'm here it's about me okay right and if it's about me everybody's going to look to me to answers and not find them on their own my message is what's important not me and so he took himself out of the picture so jesus didn't die for your sins he died so that you would take over or you could sin Oh, nice, huh? Okay, like I said, Mike gets that too. Part two. <laughs> exactly. And so, what's the lesson here? Okay, the lesson is our job as organizers and activists is not to lead the people, it's to provide tools, so get out of the way, analyses, and then get out of the way. But yeah. not just get yeah, out of the, yeah, not yeah. get out of the way at the beginning, right. right? But you do, we do have important tools and analyses and perspectives to share. But at a certain point, the last thing you need to share is get out of the way don't be fidel castro don't be fidel castro know when to do the exit do, okay. the, che, do the che Guevara. okay uh, <laughs> all right so it's the same exactly so okay so now we're we're going to go back in history wait can i tell you a funny yeah, story yeah. when sure. i was a kid yeah, jesus yeah it involves okay. miracles okay so when i was a kid i don't know if i've told you this before when we get hurt you know like when a kid falls and you know the kid's okay but the kid's crying yeah my dad used to come over to us and go, where does it hurt? And then he'd be like, my shoulder. And he'd be like, demons, out! <laughs> and he'd be like, one knee on the ground. And we would just crack up, and that was the end that's of good, that's feeling good. pain. That's good, see? Yeah. You were religious. <laughs> All right, so All right, Moses, Moses. Okay. something I know less about. Okay, so Moses, we actually came up with a unit on Moses. So we're talking about how we came up with a unit on um, Jesus when we were working right. in the Deep South. We worked for, um, a Jewish Voice for Peace. Jewish Voice for Peace, which are an amazing Jewish group who are working around BDS um, and uh, justice in Palestine and Israel. And so we're like, okay, we're going to talk about Jesus, but we got to talk about Moses. Before Jesus, there was Moses, right? right? Okay. Yeah, out of so, unit. Exactly. And so there's a lot we can talk about with Moses. Again, I'm just going to do a couple pull aways. And so... The first pull away is about Charlton Heston, okay? Right, um, great actor, a great, great NRA president. president. Exactly, and at one time he acted as Moses, okay? okay? So we're gonna be using a lot of pictures from that wonderful film, 10 Commandments. Now- Have um, you watched it? I have. I should, should I watch it? Oh, definitely. Okay. It's just amazing. All right. Um, we actually showed the clip when we did this. I remember that's like, it's, yeah. good. Anyway. It's, just, it's long though, right? It's long. Okay, right. so what does Moses do? Moses does all bunch of stuff, okay? One of the things he does is he introduces the 10 commandments to the Israelites, which are the basically laws to live by, right? And what are the 10 commandments? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt pay fair wages, thou shalt not steal, okay. thou shalt not covet neighbor's possessions, Thou shalt. Um, You're not doing badly. I'm surprised. Thou shalt hire union. What's number eight? Uh, that one is thou shalt uh, try to buy offsets when you get a flight. Okay, exactly. No, you're absolutely wrong. Okay, the fact is you don't know. The fact is actually I don't know. Right, Rebecca? Is, do you know? Do you know number eight? No, I don't, I don't know. Um, and be cool. Be to cool. One another. Yeah, be is cool. that one? That's from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> And that's the point, okay? <laughs> because, yes, yeah, some people would remember, here are the 10 points. Unreasonable to search by, and seizure. Okay? But in order, what we really remember from religion is the following. Be cool. Stories. Oh, okay. Okay? And so, you know, you make it into an engaging story. It worked for Charlton Heston in 1956 and Cecil B. Mills uh, blockbuster, but it also worked earlier than that, which is, what is the Torah? Okay. So you think the real lessons aren't the Ten Commandments, but like in the... No, the Ten Commandments are important, but they only get remembered when they're given meaning inside a story. Yeah, like, like I remember better that he came down, he went up there, they, they were, he came down. Yeah, I mean, it's like no matter if, you, if you're not religious at all, right, you probably remember something about 
Exodus, like the Pharaoh and drowning the Pharaoh. You probably remember stuff about Adam and Eve and things like that if you were yeah. raised within the Abrahamic religions. Sure. And more to the point that the Ten Commandments only make sense insofar as they're embedded in this greater story. Like we do this right. a lot, we talk about this a lot in our trainings, which is people don't remember facts. They remember facts that are embedded in stories. So, so the list is hard to remember, but the, the, that's why there's all the story around it. Exactly. All and right. we still tell stories about Adam and Eve and Exodus, and nobody tells stories from Leviticus. Leviticus, or Deuteronomy. Or Deuteronomy That's or the number. One. I mean, it's exactly who beget who and how and so and so forth. Or oh, yeah. how many doves you have to sacrifice for stealing your neighbor's goat. I mean, nobody remembers that stuff, right? We remember the stories. And the stories give us meaning. And then into those stories, we can place our facts. And this is a big part of, of uh, the religion is like talking about the stories and debating the, the meaning and all that stuff. Exa exactly. Which then gives it richness and so on and so right. forth. Meaning. Okay. Yeah. And so that's You're making the meaning. Yeah. And so that's something we have to remember as activists is we're always telling stories, right? Yes. And we should always be telling stories. Yes, we have to get facts across. You got to know that thou shall not kill. Super important. Okay. Right. But you got to put it inside a story which gives context and meaning so people remember it and so it resonates with them. Right. And Hollywood understood that. And, you know, uh, Moses understood that. Got it. Got it. All right. Good. Okay. Here's the next part. Rebecca's rushing us along here. That's okay. It's Executive okay. Executive producer. Yeah. Um, okay. So now we're going to, we've skipped a lot because we're now at the end of Moses' life. Okay. Okay. So one of the things that Moses did. Spent a life being cool to one another. He and was, then. He was kind of cool. God is not cool in the Old Testament. Just right. That out there. He's a jerk. He's kind of a jerk. He's an absent father in the New Testament and kind of an overbearing jerk in the, first, in the, yeah. in the Hebrew Bible. He's a punisher. Exactly. Okay. But in any case, Moses is cool. And one of the things that Moses did was he gave his people a dream. Right. Right. It wasn't just how it sucks in Egypt. Okay, yeah. the Pharaoh sucks. He tweets all this stupid stuff every day, and that sucks. No, he put out this dream of the promised land, right? right. That there is going to be a world where we as Jews will no longer be slaves. There's a world in which there will be justice, when there will be honey on the ground and milk from the trees and all that sort of stuff. A Shangri-La, if you will. A Shangri-La, okay? And this is actually where the Jews will no longer be in bondage, they'll have houses and land and enough to eat, it'll be their land, right? right? And that's super important because we have to have a dream. And throughout all of the Torah is a dream. Okay. And that's how it gets them to march all through the desert. Exactly. You're not going to march through the desert unless you have a dream. Yeah, not because some guy's like, hey, I'm cool. Exactly. Let's, go into <laughs> the let's, let's be cool together. Or, yeah. you know, in the memory of the Pharaoh is going to recede. You're like, was he really that bad? Those yeah. tweets were kind of funny every once in a while. At least right? some of us had houses. Right, exactly. And so it's very important to always think when anytime we're organizing, yes, we organize against. We also have to create the dream. We're going somewhere else. Exactly. Into the light. We're going to the promised land. We know where we've been. We know where we're from. We right. Know where we're going. Yeah. Go to the promised land. <laughs> it's okay. Right. That's a talking head song, right? <laughs> we know where we're going. Oh, it's And okay. we know where we're going. It's true. It's true. I was thinking of the Bob Marley version. Anyway. Okay. Now, here's the real interesting thing about Moses. Right. He never makes it there. Okay, and this is the trippy part. Okay, because you get like right to the yes. Park look, look, like, look, oh! look. No, exactly. Look, you can see in the picture. He's like looking into the promised land. Okay, and he never makes it there. Do the rest of them? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. So he dies, and they're like, thanks, and then and they go. So okay, so what's that's that? Like a lot. That happens in a lot of movies. Yeah, it does. And what that's about is, I think, is something a super important thing about utopia. Okay, because we're really talking about utopian dreams here. Right. And the takeaway there is, and this is something you made a poster about. Uh, yes. Utopia is a direction, gives us somewhere to work towards, but not necessarily. Don't trust anybody to tell you that or get you there. Yeah. And Just that. I'm saying, don't trust Moses. Yeah. No, well, Moses. Yeah, but Moses never gets there. He never says, "Hey, guys, we now exist in the utopia." Like he, it's all about becoming, right? And anytime people tell you in a utopia, whether it's the Soviet Union or the American dream or greater Israel, they're creating a lie. 
right? if they say this is going to actually be exact or they're saying we're there now right uh, okay because that's the thing is he never gets to utopia he's mm. always saying it could be better it's around the corner and it's utopia really as a as a form of inspiration and not as a location so his whole life is about getting them closer to a better life right and you know if you want to be you know literary about it the fact yeah. is that's just an arbitrary place where he is he could have gone another hundred miles and say we still haven't reached it another thousand miles still haven't reached it 2018 in israel and palestine right now and we still haven't reached it we still got to struggle for justice absolutely that's what moses would have done right okay the problem with religions is they resurrect jesus and they create the ideal israel right mm. because that's the problem is that you know the resurrection of jesus is like jesus is like i'm out and then the christian church comes and says no you're back and we've got to bow down to you right jesus and moses is lord prince of peace exactly and yeah. moses is like hey dudes we're never getting there it's always a struggle for truth and justice right yeah and then you have the establishment coming and say oh no this is our land it's already perfect you get out mm. okay that's the bad so thing. don't throw it all away yeah okay okay so we've got jesus we got moses we got moses and now we're going to do the prophet muhammad okay and there's again like all these religious figures we could go on for hours about the about the prophet muhammad and what's right. interesting about islam just to start out is it builds upon the hebrew text and it builds upon the christian text it uses a lot of the characters it's like part three it's like part three and because of that it actually brings all those stories that people already know and are familiar with and then becomes a later story on top of it they right. don't just start at ground zero it's like an accumulation yeah okay so um one of the things about the prophet muhammad okay um is about the holy text okay and the holy text of the prophet muhammad which he is filled with words by god and puts them out okay yeah um which is pretty standard for most religious sure uh, uh, you know you get enlightened by god and they say that the prophet muhammad was illiterate but all of a sudden he could speak and he could write and so on and so forth what's interesting is how the quran is structured right okay so i've been reading the quran lately okay so here's me right quran um well i'm not bragging because i'm reading in english okay <laughs> and it's really really boring really okay? yeah oh yeah i mean so is, so is all of all, all these things and i talked to my you know muslim friends about like it's really boring i'm having a hard time getting past uh, chapter one and they're like you're not supposed to read it in english you're supposed to hear it in arabic okay is that it is, is was like the shakespeare it's, of it, exactly it just poetry. reads like the bible like right exactly. i'm just gla gla glazing over exactly it. like, oh. it's poetry the quran is poetry and it's written in arabic and it's meant to be heard and recited and um remember when we were in west africa people were talking about that they had learned how to recite verses from the quran sitting around the fire at night and it'd be sort of like it was it was like a poetry battle right right right, right. um and so it's this incredible epic poem. It's a totally incredible epic poem. And it looks beautiful too. Exactly. I gotta say. And why the poem is important is one, it's about trying to figure out how to put it in a medium which can express itself beautifully, but also poetry was then, as it still is today, the art form par excellence of the Arab world. Yeah. Like that was the medium. It was the medium, exactly. And so the takeaway here is use popular culture okay right. if popular culture is poetry then you need to tell your truths in poetry if it's youtube videos then you better learn how to use youtube videos if it's tweets you better learn how to use tweets and unfortunately we have a president now who's actually a master i don't think he's inspired by god um, maybe by someone else okay but he is a master at using popular culture and using the tweets he understands that they're not about information they're about enraging people right 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 um, so in any case can i put out something else yeah, that sure. i think is kind of neat about this yeah. is that if we go back one to the um the, the image of it yeah. there's like addendums right like yeah. people add their own notes and so you've got that thing about the debating the meaning at, and that it's almost like a starting document yes, yes that you can then add to and is participatory in that way which yeah. i think is also really 
which is, and it's true for Christianity, it's particularly true for Judaism, which is like you'll yeah. find old Torahs which have literally this much text in the middle and then all of this yeah. commentary in red around the sides. So the um, commentary is like an important yeah. part of it and it's kind of democratic. Yeah, and it builds a community because it's about a back and forth, yeah. which gets us to the next part. Right. Assalamu alaikum. Malaikum salam. Oh, I even had to write that. I, was, I didn't even have to write that down for you. No, damn. I okay. Know that. So the cool thing about this common greeting in the Muslim world is it does like a multiplicity of things simultaneously. Right. right. First of all, it bonds me and Steve. Right. Because we is, know, we know, we know, we know, and we do this greeting back and forth, and all of a sudden, I'm addressing you as a Muslim. You're addressing me as a Muslim. So that's a cool thing. Okay. It immediately creates a community. The second cool thing about it is that it captures the basic meaning of Islam in this small interchange. That is, is to say, peace be upon you, my brother. And also on you, right? That's what it is? Exactly. But that's what they say in church. Yes. Yes, yes. I mean, this is this is something that Christians do. It's something that Jews do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's and, what you do when you shake hands, right? Yes. It's a yeah, call yeah, and, yeah. It's basically a call and response, right? Okay. Um, but it's encapsulated in this saying, right? And it's, so it's like doing that outside of the ceremony, like everyday life. We always do this. Exactly. And it actually creates a larger world, which bonds not just in church, but in everyday life. Right. Right. And it makes your, your, your faith part of your everyday life. Exactly. If we were going to use modern terms, I don't think the Prophet Muhammad thought of it in this terms. It's a meme. Right. It's a self-replicating piece of information, okay? yeah. which is I say it to you, you say it back to me, we say it to each other, and then it keeps going on and on and on. And what's really nice about this is it actually captures a big ideal okay, mm -hmm. in a very simple piece of information. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the takeaway here is, okay, which is we work with so many groups that we ask them to explain, okay, so what do you believe in? And like five minutes later, it's still going. Yeah. Um, and it's like, no, make it into something that can be said, build it into your name. And then even if your name gets misquote, like like mis, they misattribute or recontextualize your name, it's your politics is in your name itself. Right. Okay? Right. Act up, for example. OK. Um, all right. So there's one more lesson we got. OK. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't the lesson. Okay, the lesson is this. And this is your favorite biblical character. Okay. You want me to read it? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. so this is Paul the Apostle. Though I am free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I hate you. He's teasing me. <laughs> I don't like this. Well, I do and I don't. Okay, so let's play, explain to who Paul the Apostle is. So Paul the Apostle is really the organizer of the Christian church. And if you ever want a great lesson in how to organize people, um, read um, the Pauline letters and read the Acts, which happen after the Gospels, because it's really about kind of an organizer's manual of like how to organize people around a radical idea. Mm -hmm. So Paul is one of the major figures um, and he's controversial. So for a he's lot like of one of the 12 guys in the Last Supper painting? Yeah, or he adds himself in later, but it's, okay. it's cool. Right. Um, but he- But after Jesus uh, is crucified, he's like- Yeah, right, let, let's get to work. We need to create a legacy. Exactly. And a lot of that legacy is pretty crappy, okay? Jesus says nothing about like sexuality, or pro, you know things like that, and Paul Paul comes in and says, "Oh no no really, you got to have monogamous you know heterosexual relationships." No, oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah. So he's the All he's right. the point, another point against him. <laughs> another point against him. Okay, but I, I I'm putting it up here because I think we can learn something from this. So what, yeah, what did you learn from this? So when I first saw this, this is not the first time I've seen this. No. When I first saw it, I was like, "This guy sounds like a real shape shifting snake." Right? Like, oh, you're Jewish? I'm Jewish. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, let's, awesome. let's talk. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to save you now. <laughs> right? right? Like, oh, yeah. you're weak? I'm, oh, I feel so weak. Let me save you. <laughs> Super creepy. Exactly. 
But you've learned to actually understand something else about the Apostle Paul. I have Benedict. learned that I do this. Right. I do it all the time. Exactly. So, and I think we all do it, right? Like you sort of kind of, it's not like you change yourself, but you shift into a different form of yourself to relate to people. Yeah. And so when I, I do like this performance in front of a cap, this capitalism sign, some people may have seen, right? Where I'm engaging with regular people. And in order to talk to them, I often will like figure out where they're starting from and like figure out a, a, a point of reference that we can relate to. This is the, the work. So, so I'm trying to talk to them about economics. And if I want to really engage them, like they'll say, oh, well, you know, I think if you work hard, then you'll do fine. And I'll start by being like, oh, right. I think so too. Like I've worked really hard and it's worked out or, or um, yeah, absolutely. You know, and then I, but then I, so we have this connection. I'm like you, I think working hard is important. And I'm also troubled by this, right? And I try to, then I try to move them from there, right? Yeah. But it's starting at this point of connection. Well, and even your sign, which is about, if you could see up there, is capitalism works for me. It wasn't capitalism good or bad, right. abstraction. It was about trying to reach people where they actually were, right? right? And I think that's the key takeaway is often as activists, we have the truth. We know what's right. And other people are just stupid for not listening to us. And we approach them like that. Um, like the worst sort of, you know, uh, religious proselytizer on the street. Or like the, I have to be true. Who I am is really important and I need to be completely consistent all the time. Exactly. And, and not, uh, not suffer any sort of deviation from that what I consider to be right. Exactly, I'm gonna dress like an artist is supposed to dress, I'm gonna dress like an actor is supposed to be because that's who I am. Yeah. And meanwhile, everybody's giving you a wide berth because they know exactly who you are, they know what you're gonna to say to them, and they're just, they don't wanna hear it. And you're not connecting. And you're not connecting, yeah. right? And so the real takeaway on this is to know your terrain and use it to your advantage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, there we go. No, you're trying to use the edge. And this is actually, you, know, you may have heard this from us before, but we'll say it again and again. It's the first rule of guerrilla warfare, which is you have to know what is the topography you're working on in order to be a successful guerrilla warfare, uh, warrior. Right. Now, back when Che Guevara was talking about this, he's talking about the mountains of Cuba. Okay, when Ho Chi Minh is talking about this, he's talking about the jungles of Vietnam. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a cultural landscape, right? Right. But we've got to be able to know that cultural landscape. We've got to be able to know the signs and symbols and stories and spectacles which the people that occupy that cultural landscape hold dear. And, and that, in this case, it means like, I think sometimes a really important thing is being able to kind of let your identity not be yeah. the most important thing and figure out ways of, of inserting yourself into that terrain, you know yeah. what I mean? Becoming part of the terrain. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that means, you know, if you work amongst Jews, you should really know a lot about Moses right. and the Torah. If you work amongst Christians, you should know a lot about Jesus. If you work with Muslims, you should know a lot about the Quran um, and the prophet Muhammad. If you work working amongst um, uh, Buddhists, you should know what the Bodhisattva Gautama teachings are and if you're working amongst hindus you should know what brahma vishnu and shiva do you know they have that what right. would jesus do sort of a bumper sticker those jesus, jesus yeah. people have well we wwbvs d brahma vishnu and shiva exactly what would they do okay <laughs> and because that way we can actually connect and it's not a false connection it's a way of trying to reach people where they are and the thing is is that most of these world religions have messages again which are far more conducive to the politics that we put forth right. than, say, the BJP, you know, uh, Hindu fundamentalists in India, or the Christian fundamentalists in the United States, or the Jewish fundamentalists in Israel. They're actually not on the right side. We right. are. But when we give up that language, we deed them this terrain. Right, right, right. So right. being able to, uh, like, there's a lot more here that's that's inherently on the side of like justice equality than there is for 
keeping certain people from getting married. Yeah, there's yeah. bad stuff in there. Don't sure. get me wrong. Um, right. But okay, so what about San Francisco? Right. I was going to say, like, all this stuff is kind of religious. And as you may have figured out, I'm not a super religious person. And so I, I barely know some of these stories. I, I know that they are embedded in the culture. And some of them kind of make sense to me. But this is not a world that I am part of and just walking in here from the streets of New York City or like where I grew up in San Francisco. Like these are some of the most secular places. Yeah. And I would argue that, you know, church attendance largely down. Yeah. Right. Like the I don't know. So I guess some people are still going to Catholic schools or something. Um, or like what do they call those like uh, the Jewish things, the the schools? Yeshivas? Yeah, that. Yeah. That you know, the the historically a lower it's in a dip yeah. right now yeah, I'd say so well, what good is this okay it's the principle okay <laughs> um it's the principle is it's not about following religious figures it goes back to this notion of know your terrain and know the language people speak so, so it may be terrain? about jesus or it may be you know what uh kim and kanye do Right. Okay. See, that makes sense to me. You know, it, it, it may be about popular culture. Okay. Yes. That we have to learn popular culture. So I'm going to challenge you, Steve. Okay. Just like we challenge people to go to movies, right? To attend baseball games, to get their nails done, but to do popular cultural things. Oh, yeah. I'm going to challenge okay. you to start to go to church, to go to synagogue, to go to prayer at a Muslim house of worship. I've, I've, okay, I have done these things. Okay. Do I need to do it again? Yes. You, I think you need to read the Bible. You need to read the Quran oh. and, the, and the Upanishads. I need okay. to learn Arabic first. Okay, yeah, probably. All right, well, you, don't, you really don't have to do that, okay? But I think it is. <laughs> no, but don't be afraid of it, right? Don't like, be afraid of it, exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I think oftentimes we are afraid of religion. In the we in this case, or it seems like a big step backwards yeah. instead of a means of stepping forward. Exactly. And I think you're right, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of our uh, our the tour through the prophets, the Abrahamic prophets. You know, if you do have any knowledge from your own religious tradition, we're always willing to expand this into Buddhism and Hinduism and any other religion you can imagine. Um, sort of a Satanism. Project of ours. Satanism would be fine. Yeah. I'm all down with that. Um, but in any case, what we want to do is see if you have any questions. Um, and sort of general questions, but also within your own worlds, what knowledges are necessary? Right, what's Where, the terrain? What's the terrain, right? And what, what should you be learning in order to speak to people that you wanna to speak to? So we're literally asking that as a question mm -hmm. and you can send in your questions into the little box and Rebecca, the executive producer right exactly um, or kind will of the god feed them to the us. god figure in all of this but i would say that you know that it, within the us there are these like contemporary myths that are like the myths of the founders yeah. and stuff right yeah. like that are that aren't even based on truth like we used to talk about in the workshop that george washington uh i will never tell a lie chopping down the cherry tree, like, which is all just, I don't even know where that came from. It's just, I don't know if anybody does. No, it's just a myth, right? Right. But it is like a foundational myth that yeah. we all understand. Yep. And that if you talk about chopping down a cherry tree, no one's going to be like, what do you mean chop down a cherry tree? Right? Like they're, they know what you're talking about. Exactly. And, and it's something you can use. Yeah. And you know, I think one of the masters of this is Martin Luther King. If, if you go back to his, I have a dream speech, it, quotes from the Declaration of Independence. It right. quotes from the Constitution. It quotes from the Bible. It's like, he's like, boom, boom, boom. Here are all these languages that people know. Now I'm gonna take the black liberation struggle and put it in that. Right. Brother. So Rebecca, I'm gonna make you say these questions out loud to okay. us. Yeah, we got a good one. You here. can't be okay. invisible and silent. Yeah. So we, we got one, someone sent one in. What's that one? Um, so if your audience is into Trump, what can we take from that? And, you know, is there something around the mythology of the straight talking outsider that you can draw right. from? Right. Yeah. So I think that would be like um, elevating him. And you might want to think of a myth that is uh, like a step above that, right? Like 
who is the person that chases the snake oil sale salesman yeah. out of town? Yeah. The sheriff, right? You know, like nice. That's where I might go. Yeah, yeah. Or the you know the the person who reveals the con man for who the con man is, right? But important in both of those is understanding that he has a certain he fits into a myth, mm -hmm. and his myth is straight talking, strong businessman. Exactly. But we have counter myths that occupy the same terrain, which we can mobilize as well, which is con man. Right. Okay. I mean, I always thought during the uh, primaries, what would have happened if, say, for example, Bernie Sanders had um, debated him and just said, you know what, I'm from New York and we got a word for you. It's called a con man. I've known you for 40 years. You're a con man then. You're a con man now. Your dad was a con man. You're a con man. And it would have been, at that point, a con. Like, that's that would have been the myth, you know? Right. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think um, we talk a lot about in the workshop when you're um, when you're dealing with myths that like there's a lot of things about myths that are really unhelpful, including within religion, including within yeah. popular culture that are we probably said it on these webinars before. You know, that are like sexist, that are racist, that are yeah. um, or just encourage a sort of behavior or like reinforce things that we don't want to reinforce. And the, the trick to this and the reason it's an art form is like separating those apart and yeah. figuring out, okay, what's useful here? How do I point it in a better direction? What are the what are the things at play here in that identity or in that character that I can use? And what are the ones that we definitely want to set aside or undermine? Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Steph has a great comment. Um, so they say, largely when talking to people, I have to assume that they believe the structures they're living in are the only possible mm. structures. Oh, yeah. They may want to tweak that structure to their own benefit, but they may not even be able to imagine anything substantially different, even if it exists somewhere else. Wow. Okay. Now I'm yeah, assuming that's a good one. Everyone could hear that, but I'm I'm gonna say it one more time and then because yeah. it's really good. So largely when talking to people, I have to assume that they believe the structures they're living on are the only possible structures. Mm -hmm. So of course, right? Like reality, the part of the power of reality is that it's outside, it's there all the time. Whenever, wherever you yeah. go, there is reality. And so it seems like this is just how it is, right? So then they ask, there may be, they may want to tweak that structure to their own benefit, but they may not be able to imagine anything substantially different, even if it exists somewhere else. And this is why it is so important that you do what you do, right? that as this is what artists do right if we rely on incremental improvements right which is you know oh things are slowly moderately going to get better then we're not imagining a radically different world we're just imagining these like slight tweaks to a world that honestly is disappointing and the the so who who's going to give us those visions like politicians yeah. i would argue are much more they're not interested in revolution they're interested in incremental progress which is important but ultimately we want a wildly different world right, right. Exactly. and then the other people that present futures are commercial interests yeah advertisers right so like you're going to um <laughs> like live, I don't know, yeah, like yeah. their vision of the future involves products and right. selling and, products. Exactly, and it's going to be a time of leisure and a time of, I mean, I, I want to live in most world of advertising. But it, re, yeah, it requires, yeah. A, the, the means to get to that world is through consumer goods. Right, exactly. Right? And so if we ask them to present our visions of the future, um, it, 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 I would, it might even seem even more out of reach because you don't have the money to mm -hmm. live in that way, right? Exactly. And so this is why artists' visions and creative activists and artistic activists' visions are so important because we can present these other worlds and not just as a fantasy, but like talk about the way to get from here to there. Yeah, and that's that's key is that it's great to have the promised land. We got to know the steps to take to get to the promised land, but you're not going to take the steps unless you have the promised land to get to. Right. And again, just as an art from an art level, think about Jesus. OK, that Jesus didn't have that many tools at his disposal, but he did have his dinner table. Right. And by through this dinner table, he was actually prefiguring the world that he wanted to bring into being. He was showing doing a little performance, if you will, about what that future would be like. And so as artistic activists, we can think about, you know, staging actions, which are the world we would like to bring into being as opposed to protesting the world that we don't like. 
You right. Know? And we do that a lot in our workshops. We get people to think about sort of imaginative futures and then to act them out or perform them or represent them in such a way as they become real, like visceral for people. Right. They live within it. It's not an abstraction. It's like they dip into a future. Hey, tell, tell them about Macedonia really briefly. Well, the uh, the utopia thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there we were working with LGD, LGBTI folks in Macedonia. And um, one of the things they... I, it's a very hostile place to be an LGBT person. And uh, they're, for example, their pride parades are, they get assaulted during their pride parades, yeah, it's, things it's thrown horrible. at them. Yeah. yeah. Um, their LGBTQ center was attacked by like an angry mob. Um, the government is hostile, right? And so the natural response to that is a sort of like, Oh, you're going to be aggressive and hostile to us. Like we're going to be hostile back. We're going to fight back. Um, but it doesn't help move things forward, right? And it's that thing of talking about shifting the frame. Yeah, right? yeah, like, exactly. That we were talking about before. If you only respond to these the most violent and hostile people, then that becomes part, a big part of your identity and your public persona. So. What we dreamed up was this world where they had won, right? Another way that Macedonia could work, and we created another country called the former, Future Republic of Macedonia of the Former Republic of Macedonia, which is a reference to their name in the UN, which is the former Yugoslav Republic, Republic of Macedonia, which is a long story. It's a cumbersome name. So we made fun of the name. And, we and made it, it was country. a contextual. It's, yeah, yeah. Macedonians would have died laughing. But we made, yeah, I thought it was very funny. Um, and we made this other country in the park, right? And it, it was a little nation that existed in this little part of the park where everyone, yeah, you know, was based on love and everyone was like able we, to hang out. And we had passports and we had a, a, a right? border and so forth. And people came. And they once came, you were in, you were in that world. Yeah. And temporarily. People, and people came. It was the most popular demonstration they had had because people wanted to be part of it. We were having a lot more fun than anybody else in the park. Right. And they understood the attraction of that. But these visions are are super important. And, and I would argue that, that some of the examples of successful activism that we talk about like work because they are describing another world and working towards getting to that world. Yeah. People don't generally get ex excited about incremental change. It's hard. It's yeah. much harder to explain. Um, and it's part of what's successful about the right. Like, these grand promises of we're going to build a big, beautiful wall and Mexico is going to pay for it. I, the ambition of that is yeah. admirable. Right. Um, and then the way that that's been walked back. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a hundred miles of see-through fence at this point. It's part of, it's part of it, but, but that it was a, the right is good at, you know, like these hyperbolic, yeah. um, you know, descriptions of family, you know, a, a, a nation based on family values that yeah. returns to some sort of lost idea of its greatness. But um, but ultimately, it's regressive and it's a lie. Right. Yeah. And 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 it's a they 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 can't really deliver. And again, the the goal is not to take people to utopia, but lead them towards progress. So we're presenting a vision also, but the steps towards that actually do get closer to that. Right. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's about time, actually. And so um, we're going to leave you with a heads up on what's happening next week. Um, so one of the things that we have done as the center is that we, as we work with people, we get to know them really well. Um, and we've gotten, we've worked with sex workers in Europe, and we've worked with transgender folks also in Europe. Yep. And so we're going to be working with two people, or I'm sorry, we're going to be inviting two people that we've worked with who then have gone on to do amazing projects. Um, the first one is Kate, who um, is a Dublin sex worker and sex worker organizer. And she's going to talk about a project she did in Dublin, which we helped mentor her and found a little bit of seed money for. But, you know, she took it and she ran with it. She's going to talk about the promises and problems, um, the challenges, and uh, where she's going to take it next. Also, um, our friend Ariane, who's a transgender organizer in the Balkans, um, particularly in Croatia, 
also someone we met in one of our workshops who's doing great things and who we've been working with and brainstorming with over the past couple of months. And he's going to be talking about his project as well. And Zeth, you're going to want to watch this one because both of them talk about creating a, uh, um, like, how to envision this more just world through those projects. So Great. So I think that's it for today. Um, peace be upon you. And also with you, is that right? Close enough. Okay. See you later.